Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends, and welcome elite achievers. Here we are, another episode of Modern Leadership, and we're going to have so much fun today. On the mic, we have James Sudikow, a creative thinking business leader and the irreverent corporate author of Out of the Blur, a delirious dad's search for the holy grail of work-life balance. You know how much we talk about this. Can't wait to jump in. James specializes in helping companies manage organizational transformation, create talent management and strategies and programs that maximize employee capabilities and improve business performance. Wow, that's a mouthful. He's also a contributing columnist on Inc.com. He's been featured in the Chicago Tribune, Forbes.com, Fast Company, Life Hacker, Sirius XM, and I could go on and on. So many different featured articles. He and his wife are raising four kids along with one dog, one rabbit, and seven chickens in America's finest city, San Diego. James, it's so great to have you on the podcast today. How are you? I'm good. And thanks for mentioning the chickens. They would have been upset if they didn't get some degree of a call out there. So I'm doing good. Well, we got to give our hat tip to the chicken raisers out there. We, We rarely have guests that are raising chickens. I don't get any credit. It's my wife. You know, my wife has always wanted to do it, and she's a vegetarian, so she doesn't eat eggs or anything, but she would love to have chickens run around the yard. I don't know why. I'm going to tell you, they're a lot cooler than people think they are, and, and you know, she's a vegetarian, but my wife does it purely for the, the, the backyard fresh eggs, and of course, the kids get really used to like being around animals, so that's, that's really the bigger picture. They learn how to kind of respect and be around animals, which is really cool. Well, I'm super excited to jump in this topic, James, and and really talk about your book and all the great things you've got going on. Uh, But before we do that, can you give us just a little bit of background, who you are and uh, what brings you to the show? Yeah. So so as you mentioned, I I started my own consulting practice almost a decade ago, and it's hard to believe. I always tell my wife it would be a one-year experiment. And so somehow eight, nine, 10 years later, I'm still doing it, which is great. And it's always been a dream of mine to kind of do that. Um, and then previous to that, I spent lots of time in the business world in lots of different ways um, before starting my own business. And it was kind of that thing that got me starting to think about this whole concept of work-life balance um, from a dad's perspective. We have kind of a unique family environment. We have two little ones, uh, like a three-and-a-half-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. One but my wife and I are also raising her younger brother and sister, so we're legal guardians for them. But they're older. They're 17 and 21, and we got them when they were 7 and 11. So we have this really interesting like ecosystem at home of toddlers and teenagers, as I like to describe it, on top of trying to run a business and be a good husband. And so all of that kind of had me swirling around for a good number of years, as you might expect, until I started saying, I got to try to figure out how to solve this problem. And I, I assumed there were lots of other people that had their own unique permutation of, of their families and their work um, that might be able to kind of get something out of the experiences that I had. And you came to the right place because this is a topic we talk about a lot. Uh, most of the listeners of this audience are, are of this potted cast are at some career transitional stage. You know, they're, they're either leaving the business world to go into entrepreneurship or they're climbing the corporate ladder. And we've all got our stories, right? And balance is always a big topic. And so I'd love to get you on the show and have this conversation. I also think we talked prior to this about Family Before Fortune, which was the podcast I ran for a number of years, where you can have both, right? You can have success and you can raise your family. So let's jump into this a little bit, this delirious dad. So tell us about this book and how you got into it. Yeah. So so where it came from, quite honestly, was, you know, I was notorious for years for for thinking that the way to get to work-life balance was simply just do everything. And that's how I ran my life. And, and it was kind of this superhero concept of I'm going to get everything done at work and I'm going to get everything done at home and without kind of any sort of thought process around how that might actually be impacting me as an individual. And so I finally realized that that just wasn't sustainable, right? And so what it caused me to do was kind of to try to think differently about like, how do I actually think about work-life balance? And I was, I was a little bit um, worried because I started reading all these articles about what all these other people had said about it. And there's this really, there's a couple of really interesting themes out there that have me concerned. Like, is this work-life balance thing even possible? There were a lot of people out there saying, Hey, forget about it. Work-life balance is a myth. Like it doesn't exist. It's like a, it's like a false reality. So don't even try to have it. Um, it's the belief that you think you can, that makes you stressed out, which causes you to feel like you don't have work-life balance. And I said, well, that doesn't sound very good. 
And then the other thought that you hear a lot out there is that don't, don't worry about work-life balance. It's impossible. You have to do this work-life blend thing or work-life integration where you just bring them all together. And that had me scared beyond belief because I'm not very good at multitasking. And I said, there is just no way I can possibly do this. So I had this really interesting epiphany one day as I was driving home from a client. You know, I do work with business clients around transformation. I kind of asked myself, I said, you know, if I was a client of mine, how would I actually approach solving my own work-life balance issue? And I started applying, strangely enough, the business methodology that I use with my business transformation clients to my own life around work-life balance. And that kind of put me down a path of visioning, doing a current state assessment, figuring out what the behaviors were that didn't align with my vision. And that's kind of where this whole thing went. And I put myself on a year-long transformation based upon that to get to a different end game. It was a really interesting process to kind of go through, but that's where it started. Well, one of the things that I like to talk about a lot is being intentional. And as you were walking through kind of your your growth stage through learning this process, one thing that popped into my mind is, you know, not work-life balance or work-life integration, but work-life intention. And so, you know, as, as we look at this, I was really resonating with what you were saying about this uh, desire to be able to do everything. And I think many of our listeners are in this stage where we feel like the way that we can do it is to be the superhero, to go home and be the super dad, to go to work and be the super you know, boss or super entrepreneur or super employee. What do we do as far as a mindset standpoint, a starting point for us? What do we do to kind of combat that desire or that need, that internal need to be the superhero? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it was one of the hardest things that I struggled with during the year that I did this because it is, I mean, I'd I'd find these traps and one of the traps that I called out was the the trap of the superhero syndrome, which is the detrimental effects of trying, thinking you can do everything. And one of the things that I had to start to do was, you know, some businesses are really good at this. They call it ruthless prioritization. You, You may have heard businesses talking about that, but we don't apply it to our lives as much. And I can honestly say, I certainly didn't apply it to my personal life, right? Because as a dad, you want to like do everything. That's partly what, how I define myself as a dad, right? Being there to do everything that needs to be done around the house, whatever it is. And then you bring that kind of same thinking to and from work. So one of the things that I actually started to implement was this, this kind of rule of three mission critical things. And I kind of started saying to myself, if I could only choose three mission critical things at work or at home to do every day, what would they be? And this is coming from a guy who used to have lists, and this sounds ridiculous now in retrospect, but this is coming from a guy who used to have a daily list of like 18 to 20 things to do a day. Like my lists were ridiculously long, and somehow I found a way to do them all because I was like, you know, I was a superhero. as just like lots of other people. I got them all done. But when I really forced myself to ask the question of like, what would be my mission critical three things, so many things dropped off the list, not because they weren't important but because they weren't mission critical. And that alone started changing my mindset to the point now where if I start getting my list out of control, it almost like gives me a headache because I'm now I'm used to seeing it from a very different perspective. Whereas before I used to like congratulate myself on getting 18 to 20 things done. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that was the mindset shift I had to make was stop focusing on the quantity, stop focusing on the mission critical three things. And I purposely kept myself to three just so that I could force myself to go down that prioritization path. And this is a great topic because I'm right here looking at my to-do list for today. There's 31 things on my to-do list. 15 of them are from yesterday. 15 of them are from today. And now they're all combined. And and by the way, we're recording this later in the afternoon. So, you know, there's no way I'm getting 31 more things done tonight. So the reason I wanted to dive into this, ask you a little bit deeper about this is how do we avoid the trap of condensing our to-do list just in instead of saying, you know, these are my three mission critical things, I have a 30 item to do list. How do I keep myself from just taking those 30 items and putting them into categories and saying, you know, mission critical step number one is to do these 10 things? Does that make sense? Oh, it totally does. I mean, I'll see if my answer makes sense to you. So, so when I, so when I started going down this path, one of the things I realized was that there's this trap of the superhero syndrome, which is a mindset around getting everything done. But there's another one that comes right there with it. And they almost like feed each other and they create this weird, perfect storm. And I think it'll answer the question you're asking. The other thing that I found is that we, we fall into a trap of this, of this thing that I call artificial urgency, which is this trap of like this tendency to make things urgent when they're really not. And 
if you work in the business world, this is a hard one to avoid because we put deadlines on things all the time. If you ask yourself like a real question and force yourself to go through what I call like an urgency filter, uh, many of the things that we determine are urgent actually are nothing even close to urgent. But for whatever reason, we've created this manufactured urgency, which creates manufactured stress. At least it did for me. The reason I am, I'm kind of going down that path of artificial urgency and why I highlight it so much is because if you can reduce the amount of things that you're articulating as urgent by simply putting them through a filter that would take them out of the equation, that finds its way into how long your list of things to do is that you try to be a superhero around. Does that make sense? And what I found was when I started like doing a much better job on artificial urgency, when I started asking really hard questions like, hey, is this really going to degrade my business if I do, don't do this today? Or is the family going to fall apart if I don't do this today? Most of the time, as you might expect, my answers were no. My business isn't going to fall apart if I don't do this today. And my family isn't going to fall apart if I don't do this today. I eliminated four or five things off of the list that I had to do that I was trying to be a superhero around. And then slowly it started whittling itself down simply by focusing on doing a better job on artificial urgency. And this is a great light bulb moment. I want to make sure that our audience is paying attention at this point, this trap of artificial urgency. I think this is something that I struggle with a lot, James, and that is I have 31 things on my list. I think they're all important, but the reality is, the truth is, they can't all be that important because 15 of them were supposed to be done yesterday, and somehow they, they were okay to last till today, right? Yeah, exactly. The world is still turning. The moon is coming up. The sun's coming up. Everything's still okay, <laughs> right? Well, one of my favorite things in your book is that you go through these eight traps, and we've talked about two of them, but I want to make sure the audience is staying with us on this. These are the eight traps that you discovered as you went through this process of you know, what you call ruthless prioritization. And by the way, if you're not ruthlessly prioritizing what's going on in your life, if you're passively prioritizing, that's when you get overwhelmed. That's when you get out of control. That's when your to-do list says 31 instead of three. So let's talk about these eight traps. So the first one is the trap of forgetting about yourself. So tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. And this was one that I suffered through quite a bit. And, and some people are better at this, quite honestly, than others. But I talked to a lot of other dads and, and moms out there. And, and as like parent life comes into play and as your career comes into play, you get to this interesting point in your life where a lot of what you're doing is for other people. Right. I mean, especially if you're a parent, I mean, your life in many ways is you're 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 doing for your kids and then you go to work and you're doing all the work that you're doing there. It becomes super easy to like leave, like, as I describe it, make yourself the odd man out of the equation, right? And I have lots of things that I like to do for myself individually. Um, but those things, uh, if I were to rank order where they fell on the list, they started falling off the list because the other things to do for others became more important. So that trap of like forgetting about yourself is a really important thing because work-life balance, as I found it, is about work, it's about life, and it's about you as an individual. And the thing that I learned is I was leaving myself out of the three-pronged equation. <laughs> and then so then you have no way of regenerating all the energy you need to do the work and the life part. Yeah, if you're not having a good experience in life, I mean, we're, we're whole individuals. So if you're not taking care of yourself, it's going to come out in other areas and other relationships that you're having. And I think this is really huge because I think a lot of dads suffer from this. I mean, I think we, we really put our prioritization of our family so importantly. And I don't think what you're saying is to not prioritize your family. I don't think you're saying to, you know, forget about them or to snub them or to be selfish but to consider what you need. And like, I'll give you an example in my life. I play ice hockey and ice hockey takes a couple of hours and it's a couple of hours away from the family. But guess what? My league plays at 9 p.m. at night. My kids are all in bed. They're all asleep. They don't even know dad's gone, frankly. And so that's a way that I can do what I want to do, need to do to recharge my batteries and be ready for the day, but also make sure that my kids know when I'm here, I'm with them. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I mean, what I learned about myself, which is why I, this was such an important one is I actually was not my best person at work, nor was I my best person for my family when I, when I didn't have at least some element that was for me, just for me. So like you said, it's not about being selfish. I actually found that it helped me be better as a dad and better as a husband and better in my job when I was able to just carve out something that just helped me focus on me. Like, and when I wasn't doing that, I wasn't as good of a dad. I mean, that's the thing about it. I was allocating more time to it, but I wasn't as effective at it. 
Yeah, and and we as dads, we really need to just make this an intentional thought process. And on this podcast, we're giving permission to you as the listener to really look at what you need to recharge your batteries and to carve away some time to do those things that matter to you and help you to be your best self. So that's the first trap. The second two we talked about, the trap of the superhero syndrome and the trap of artificial urgency. Our fourth trap then is the trap of undefined boundaries. So tell me about this. Yeah. So this one, God, I mean, we are in a, we're in a place now and it's really interesting. It's really interesting time to be working and living, right? We're in a place where technology for all intents and purposes has erased many natural boundaries that used to be there. Right. And, and so what I mean, dad and all the stuff that he did in terms of work-life balance, and he was always there for us and he had a really big, important job and he did all that stuff. But because of where technology was or wasn't, and this isn't all just about technology, but because of where it wasn't, there were actually natural boundaries that were in place between work and life. And maybe the things that that in his generation they used to worry about was this inability to connect. We're in a world now where it's really hard to disconnect, right? Because the technology has made us accessible everywhere we go. And one of the things that we do about it is we are accessible everywhere we go. Even someone like me who kind of liked to usually pride himself on being able to separate out. And so we're in a world where all all the boundaries that used to exist that made it a little bit easier to figure out where our life was and where our work was, they're all kind of gone. And we're also now in a place where some of us worry that we're going to kill our our careers if we try to reestablish those boundaries because the guy next to us at work says, yeah, text me anytime. And so it's a really interesting place. But one of the things that I found was, you know, you can compartmentalize. And it was actually one of the big things that I learned on this whole journey was I can actually re boundaries. I can create very strict compartmentalization between work and life, meaning I'm focused only on work or I'm focused only on life side of the equation. And my career won't suffer. I haven't lost one client as a result of it. And I was nervous that I would once I kind of drew that line to say, hey, I got to do this. Um, and that's where that was a really, really interesting dynamic. And I had all sorts of bad habits where I was, you know, checking email on my phone while bottle feeding the baby once. And that was kind of an epiphany where I said, well, this isn't right. <laughs> so I got to stop this. Yeah. And I was doing it. And, and I'm not even bad compared to some of my friends who I know do it even much, much more than I was. Yeah. And you talk about in the last trap, the one of artificial urgency. Well, this is kind of the same thing. It's this artificial uh, requirement that we need to keep working all the time. And I got to tell you, this really hits home with me, James. I work from home. So, you know, my kid, my kids come in. In fact, it's, I'm grateful that I can edit these podcasts because the kids will come in sometimes right in the middle of an episode, want to say hi. And, you know, while oftentimes we think of, you know, work-life balance as making time for our family, you know, with, with the new generation of work that has you working from home, working from the road, location independent, sometimes work-life balance requires you to set time aside to work, but it's all about establishing boundaries to know where and when you're going to do what you're going to do. One of the things that I was doing, I was definitely, I was living a work-life blend life without even knowing it, right? Because I had never like thought about these boundaries like this. And what I found was like my head was literally bouncing back and forth like, like a ping pong ball all day long, back and forth between work, life, work, life, work, life. And I wasn't like as effective or efficient at either of them until I actually started creating some boundaries, which allowed for me to be much more productive on both fronts. And I didn't even realize how inefficient I was. I did a whole bunch of research on multitasking and the fallacy of that it's not really even possible, but we think we're doing it. And your productivity is way down when you're trying to do it. And so this all kind of fits into this notion of like when you actually create some boundaries and compartments for work and for life, you actually do a better job in both of those anyway. And you're more efficient, ironically, even though you don't think you would be. Yeah, we could redefine multitasking as diminished productivity because, yeah, all of us can try to do multiple things at once, but we can't do everything at the same time quality-wise or in, in good. So our next trap then is the trap of late nights and getting it all done. And I think we've talked a little bit about this and setting boundaries and so on and so forth. Let's go on to the sixth trap, and that is the trap of the no buffer zone. So tell me about this. Yeah. So this one I kind of describe as like, this is the practice of just not leaving time for the unexpected. And, you know, it's a funny trap because at work, I'm like spectacular at creating buffer, right? I've, I'm really good at it. I mean, cause I've been doing it for a long time. I understand where the challenges might be and Hey, you know what? 
we're creating a timeline that's based on a best case scenario. There's no way that's going to happen. So let's give ourselves some buffer. What I found, I didn't know how to think about buffer as it pertained to the combination now of work and everything now that was entailed with being a dad and a different role at home. And so what I found was my buffer zone just went completely away. And so that kind of created an environment which caused the, another trap, which is constant triage, right? I'm constantly in a reactive state because I just didn't know how to plan for all of the stuff that was going on at home and with, with, with like parenthood and relate it back to the stuff that I had to do for work. So it's a symptom when I talk to a lot of other dads out there, one of the things that, that I heard was this, this idea that um, we're pretty good at it at work, but we don't think about it the same way at home. And what I've learned is you almost have have to think about planning for buffer time the same way at home that you do when you're thinking about a project at work, which can feel like a really kind of lame way to think about your family. But I found it to be hugely valuable. And now I do this thing at home where I literally allocate literally 50% extra time to everything I do just because I do not know what kind of unforeseen circumstance is going to come up, especially when you got a lot of kids running around. Yeah, and 50% sounds like a pretty big buffer. So tell me about that, how you decided upon 50%. It was an arbitrary number, to be honest with you. I said, look, my experience is if I think something's going to take an hour, let me just give it an hour and a half. And what I actually found to your point is I don't always need an hour and a half. Sometimes I'm actually pretty good and it's close to an hour. And then what the benefit is, I get a half hour bonus time where, yeah, and it becomes bonus time where I can, hey, maybe I can go play the piano and do my restorative activity. Or maybe I can just sit and relax and think for a little while. Or maybe I can actually plan for what's going on in the family in a very different way than I used to. And then sometimes it does take the hour and a half, right? So that's kind of where I started. I'd rather over allocate the buffer time than under allocate the buffer time. I think it's such a great idea. And as you've been talking about this, I've been thinking about baseball and we're a big baseball family. We love it. And when you look at the outfield, you know, they have that, you know, 10 or 15 feet of dirt out there so that when the outfielders are running straight at the wall to catch the ball and their focus is on the on the ball they don't run smack into that fence and think about this in your business and in your life when you're running so hard you're trying to be fully intentional with either your family or with your business it's nice to have that little buffer area that little warning that says hey i'm going to run into the fence if i don't keep my head up yeah no it's exactly that and, you know, the other thing that I found, which I thought was really interesting for me is, you know, this concept of want versus need. Um, one of the things that I found at work is I'm really good at deciding what's a want versus a need. But at home, what I found is I was terrible at it. I was terrible. Everything was a need because it's my family and I wanted it. I wanted to do everything. And so that was contributing to the buffer zone problem. So I started planning better about what was really want and what was need and actually planning for the need versus everything that I had like miscategorized as, as a need when it really wasn't. And that's such an important step to, for all of our listeners to take in their lives is identifying what is truly a need versus what we perceive as a need. Or if we go back to that same terminology we've been using, artificial urgency or artificial need that we set and create for ourselves. So that's a great one. That's number six. Number seven then takes us to this trap of constant triage. And I got to, before you jump into this, James, I got to tell you, my job, I deal with a lot of like problems. I jump in and triage. I do a lot of coaching. And most of the people that I'm on the phone with are going through some sort of challenge, some sort of trial that needs immediate action. So here we come to the trap of constant triage. What is this? I describe it most simply as the trap of living in a reactive state. And, and you can see how all these traps like fuel each other, right? If I'm trying to be a superhero and I'm trying to do too much stuff and I haven't reconciled artificial urgency, you end up with such a long list of things to do that you don't have any time to really plan how your activities are going to fit together between work and life. And you end up just triaging, you end up getting in triage mode. And, and you know, if, if kind of how you just described your situation, I know that when I've been in triage mode at work, all of your strategic planning then goes out the window because there's no time to strategically plan because you're using that time to triage which becomes this really bad cycle because you never get that strategic planning time back. So you constantly end up in triage. And that reactive mode doesn't ever allow for you to really kind of think about what do I need to course correct as it relates to trying to achieve some sort of vision, as I've described for it, of my own work-life balance. So it's a really big like negative spiral. Once you're in triage, it's almost like the centrifugal force like keeps sucking you in and you can't get out of the triage. 
And I think this is a real problem that we find not just with business owners and entrepreneurs, but also with employees, especially middle management and senior level employees. And that is they're constantly fighting fires. They're constantly triaging. They're constantly like focused on reactive. There's no opportunity to create, to change, to innovate, to do things that will be more productive. And frankly, I think we're losing an awful lot of the brain power within corporate America today because it's too busy triaging so much stuff. Well, and that's such a great point. There's been, you, you probably know this, I mean, given what you just said, there's been a whole bunch of research on the lack of like what I guess people are calling the white space anymore because we're, we're so busy running from one thing to the other. We're so busy fighting the fires that we're actually losing even our ability to think strategically, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember the days when strategic thinking in the business world was like a three to five year plan. Now it's almost like, like we're looking at one year and we're going to break this down by quarters, right? It's just a man. It's just an example like of how we've gotten. And the same thing applies with work-life balance. I mean, one of the things I started doing was, hey, you know what? I should think strategically about my role as a dad at home. And that almost sounds like something, of course, I should be doing that as a dad, but I wasn't. And so as soon as I got at home, I was in total reactive mode at home with the kids. So I had to stop that. I had to literally think about, okay, what are all the things that, that my wife and I are trying to do for the kids? And then how does that fit in with all the stuff I'm doing at work? That was the only way that I could actually start to get out of triage mode was by actually, this sounds really corny, but strategically planning for how the life side of the equation works. I don't think it sounds corny at all. In fact, I think it's kind of sad as we look at, you know, a lot of people, including myself, that fall into this trap of we go to work and we have a strategic plan and we have KPIs and we we have measurements and we're improving and we're setting smart goals. And then we come home and we just live reactively. We just live passively. That's exactly right. So I tried to employ that exact kind of approach to say, look, it works at work. What if I tried this at home? And it doesn't always work because you just don't know what the heck's always going to happen, especially with kids. But it works a lot more than just kind of letting it happen to you. That's for sure. Well, and part of your strategic planning can be how to deal with emergencies or how to deal with uh, things that happen. You know, last, last couple of weeks ago, both you and I, our kids were sick. And we were joking before we started recording that how come we couldn't plan that? How come we couldn't schedule that to be, you know, on a good time <laughs> for us? But that's life. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like you can't get everything, but at least you can have a plan for how you're going to deal with some of these things and contingency plan, just like, just like we're expected to do at work, right? Nobody goes in and presents a best case scenario without somebody asking them, what's your contingency plan? Well, I started coming up with contingency plans for the life side. And, and that was really helpful for a guy like me who needs some like mental process time. Yeah, such a, such a great idea. Our final trap then is the trap of chasing time. And like you said, all of these kind of tie in together. But as, as you start to fall down or fall into the trap of some of these other ones, then you get behind a little bit and then all of a sudden you get this trap of time. So tell us about this chasing time. So it's kind of a funny title, but I found myself doing this and, and ultimately it's not the root cause trap. And what I mean by that, some of these other ones are a lot bigger root causes. It's more like the end of the tail trap that other things aren't going well, you find yourself doing this. But the reason that I think it's worth talking about is because it's like the root of work-life balance. At least it was for me. And what, what, what basically the trap of chasing time is, is like not being mentally where you are. And it's a manifestation of having all this stuff to do. And so, for example, when I'm playing with my kid, what am I thinking about? Not playing with my kid. I'm thinking about the five emails that I need to send. When I'm sending the five emails, I'm thinking about, shoot, I need to get to, you know, our teenager's volleyball game. So it's always like, mentally being detached from where you are because you're thinking about what's the next thing that I have to do. And that's a real bummer because you're not enjoying any of it anymore. Like I'm not enjoying the work that I'm doing and we all choose our jobs because we, we like them, I would hope. And so I'm not enjoying the work because I'm thinking about what I'm behind on, on the next stuff I have to do. And then when I'm doing the family stuff, I'm thinking about the work stuff that I have to do. And so it's a really bad problem. It's like a time zone issue where your, ment your mind is not in the same time zone as your body and you don't get to enjoy any of what you're doing, whether it be work or life. And an example of this in, in kind of my history and my life, you know, we took a year off and traveled the world. And as we traveled, you know, we were in 12 different countries. And so while we were there, we had time to kind of get up, enjoy the culture, enjoy the food, get to know people and really take it slow. And I compare this with the way that most people vacation, you know, where they show up and it's like 6 a.m. Everybody's got to be out of bed because we have to see 47,000 sites today. And then everyone gets home grumpy at midnight night and we got to do it all again tomorrow. It's the same thing with our lives in this trap of chasing time. It's, 
you know, making sure that you're enjoying the moment and experiencing it and not trying to just rush through it. Yeah. Be in the moment that you're in. And what I found is ironic about that. You know, there's this old expression, everybody knows it like time flies when you're having fun, but my whole goal was to actually slow down the time, right? So be in that moment, make it go slow and enjoy the slowness of like what you're doing versus like having it just kind of hitting you at a hundred miles an hour all the time. Yeah, I can relate to this so much and I love it. This book, Out of the Blur, A Delirious Dad's Search for the Holy Grail of Work-Life Balance, dives into these eight traps. It's got some illustrations that you got to see. It's hilarious. It's a great book. James, I sure appreciate being able to jump into these eight traps and I recommend that our listeners go out and get a copy. Uh, But now I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about learning from leaders. It's one of my favorite sections of the podcast where we find out a little bit more about you. Sound like a plan? Yeah, sounds great. All right. Our first question then is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. Yeah. So this is, that's a great question. Um, given that I have young kids, you might think my answer is going to be, you know, books about Mickey Mouse, um, Good night, Moon. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Tiger or Dr. Seuss. That's what we read in my house. But actually the book that I read over and over again, because, and it's related to some of the stuff we've been talking about is uh, chicken soup for the soul. I don't know if you ever read that book. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, it's a great perspective setter and it just, it's such an awesome book and it keeps your mind on the right stuff and keeps your perspective in the right place. So I keep it there and, and I'll just kind of thumb through it a lot of nights just to kind of get me in the right frame of mind before I go to bed and then wake up the next day. And I like the style, right? It's short, it's stories, it's impactful and it's, you know, you don't have to labor through it like a business book. It's, it's got a, a better flow. Yeah. Super easy to read. You can read it in compartments, which, you know, fits with my whole desire for compartmentalization, but, and you get your little quick things there and it's really awesome. Gets you in the right mindset and then, and then you can kind of go to the next day and, and hit it head on. Yeah. Great recommendation. How about your leadership superpower? So I, I think mine is probably a combination of two things. One is, um, adaptability and the other is positivity. And, and I just, you know, at the end of the day, not to, not to make the work that we do in, in the business world seem less important than it is because it's important. But at the end of the day, you know, it's really about there's a, there are bigger things than what happened to me in my job that day. So this whole positive aspect of let's just kind of there's always something good. There's always something good that can come out of something. And there's always going to be a need to be flexible because the world's constantly changing and you got to be adaptable. And, and those are the kind of the messages that I try to teach the kids is, look, life's going to knock you down a thousand times. Um, the people that do the best get up and kind of move on. And they adapt. And that's kind of how I see, like, I think my entire career has been about. And we talk about, you know, kind of being hardwired as humans as having this fight or flight. And I think moving into the future, uh, this hardwire of adaptability, I mean, the more we can exercise that muscle or help, help our children understand this flexibility, adaptability, I think it's going to give them an absolute advantage in the future because the world is changing so quickly. Our kids are probably going to be working in careers that don't even exist right now. They're going to be new ideas and they're going to have to be flexible, adjustable to those opportunities. Yeah. I mean, I think about the time I've spent working just in my own career and there are so many things that exist now that didn't even exist 10 years ago that nobody even thought about, or at least we haven't thought about. And you figure it out, right? And you adapt and you and you can complain about it or you can kind of say, hey, you know what, let's see how to use it positively. So I agree. I think that's such a hugely valuable thing is this ability to be flexible and adaptable and agile. What a great superpower. Our next question is your motivational quote, philosophy or mantra that you live by. Yeah, so I have one, and I don't, I don't know if my dad came up with it. He always took credit for it when he was alive, but I'll, I'll give him credit for having come up with it unless I mention it to you and you say, no, 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 there was someone way more famous than your dad who said that. <laughs> All right. So my, I, the reason I, I use my dad is you know, he, was, he was definitely my hero in life, and, and, I, and I thought he was such a great dad, and there were so many great things to emulate about him. But one of the things he always used to tell me is since I was a young kid, he used to say, look, people will always find reasons why they can't do something be a person that finds the reasons why you can do something. And I, I just thought that was such a great like way to think about life because th- there are always going to be lots of reasons why you can't do it. But if you think about the reasons why you can, you can do a whole lot of really cool stuff. And so that's, and I try to teach that to the kids as well. Yeah, such a great thought. And we'll give credit to your dad for coming up with a great idea. Final question then is the book that you most often gift to friends, family, or colleagues? Yeah, so this is um, this is actually a business book, um, and I, I absolutely love it. And it's intended to be a business book, but I've found it quite useful uh, in parenting. There's a book by a guy named Dr. Robert Cialdini. It's called Influence, 
Um, and, and for those of who do, may not know who he is, I mean, he's like one of the preeminent researchers out there on the, sci- the science, actually, talk about being hardwired, the hardwiring of us as people around the science behind persuasion and influence. And it's such an awesome book because it breaks down all of these kind of tools and levers that we can pull that help us influence people, not in a manipulative way, but in an ethical way, of course. But when I, the first time I got a hold of that book years ago, man, it opened up so many doors in terms of like how I worked. But it also has given me a lot of tools around how I parent, um, especially with teenagers, quite honestly, right? So there's all these things that I think about. So I give that to people a lot to say, hey, this book, I know it was intended as a business book, but there's a whole lot of broader application to it. It's a really awesome book. It's an easy read. Also, there's lots of stories, examples in there too. Um, and I just love it. And I, and I use it all the time. It's such a great book. And when it comes to like cells, which is kind of Robert Cialdini's kind of background, you know, he just came out with his newest book, Persuasion. But when it comes to sales, what harder audience do you have than teenagers? <laughs> so true. And I, I will honestly say there are times where I've used everything I can think of from that book to try to like combine them with teenagers. And, uh, you know, I find that I'm a lot more successful than I used to be, although I still have many times where I walk away going, well, that didn't work. <laughs> I'm going to have to rethink this one. <laughs> the school of hard knocks, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, James, this has been a terrific podcast episode. I love your attitude. I love the the journey that you went on in discovering for yourself what these traps are, identifying solutions to them, and now your mission to go out and make sure that people across America and across the world understand these traps and are able to build and work out of them. Thank you for being this week's Modern Leader guest. Before we let you go, I want to give you the last word, any last bit of advice, and how can we pick up a copy of this book? Yeah, you know, the, the only last, the, the last word of two things, the last word of advice I'll give people is the, one of the biggest learnings at a broad level that I had is, you know, there's a whole lot of work-life balance challenges just in the macro environment of work these days. But one of the things that I found was, you know, forget about those things. We can't control them. There are things that we can actually control about our own behaviors. And that's what I focused on here. And it made a huge world of difference, even though I can't control the fact that companies are consolidating or that there's a lot less people to do a lot more work. I can't make those decisions but I can control certain things about how I approach my work in my life. And that's what I found was a really big difference. Um, and then, so where can people get the book? Um, they can get it on my website, which is um, jamessudakow.com. So J-A-M-E-S-S-U-D-A-K-O-W.com. It's also available on Amazon. Um, you can get it there as well. Excellent. And we're going to link all that up on the show notes for this so they can just go right on over and click on it and get a copy of it. Highly recommended. James, you've been a great guest. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right, my friends, what did you think about that? I had a blast hanging out with James, and what a great story. What a great background. What a great book that he thought about and put the time into research and really put together these eight traps that I think a lot of us go through. Now, I know it was intentionally written for dads and their environment, but I think it really goes for any of us that are really trying to create that work-life balance, that work-life integration, or as I like to claim now as my own at the start of this episode, work-life intentionality. My big takeaway from this episode is this idea between ruthless prioritization and passive prioritization. Either you can be intentional and ruthless about what you put your intention towards, what you put at the top of your list, the prioritization that you do, what he calls the mission critical items, or passively it's going to be set for you. You're going to have to be reactionary to what's going on around you. And so identify what it is that's mission critical in your life. Put those in place. Look at these eight traps. See if you're suffering from any of them. Do what you need to do in order to overcome them. Work on this work-life intentionality that we talked about. Of course, everything from this episode, including the books and the quotes and the uh, all the everything we talked about can be found on the show notes, which are found at jakeacarlson.com slash ML93, episode 93, and uh, everything will be there. Until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life. Focus on the mission critical and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. 
You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.